Meta Podcast Series from the Integral Stage, where we podcast podcasters, broadcast broadcasters, and use the internet to reflect on internet projects from people who are trying to bring forth higher, deeper, more developmental, more transcendental, more transformational, and more authentic ways of being. Today, Adam Kennedy. Hi, Adam. All right. Tell us uh, who you are, where you are, and what this project is that you're working on. Hey, man. So uh, first, thanks for thanks for like uh, having me on here, man. This is a uh, this is really a really cool experience. I uh, love you and the work you're doing. Uh, so Adam Kennedy, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia currently, and I am trying to start a nonprofit called the Origin Project. Um, it is an integral uh, embodiment and practice uh, organization. Uh, we um, we feel like uh, embodiment is is very much necessary right now, and using like integral values to ground to help use embodiment to help ground those uh you know values into the world is something we feel is really important right now when did you get interested in john gebser <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I i discovered in a role uh 2008 i was in the barnes and noble bookstore sitting in front of the new age book section i saw ken wilbur i ignored it i ignored it for months and then uh, and then one day I, I just decided to look at it and it was still too heady, too academic. I was in a very much in a, in a feeling mode. So, so I put it down, but I, I found a version online, an audio book. I got sick and I had like, I was down for a whole week. So I decided to listen to the audio book and I did, and I was hooked. And then um, I discovered that Atlanta had the, its own integral salon. It was the, the Atlanta uh, Ken Wilber meetup and in integral salon. So I joined that. And then we, um, just had a lot of great conversations, learned a lot about Wilbur, a lot, a, lot, a lot about Integral, and got really involved in that scene. And then I was online, and I was like, you know, researching Integral, and there's this cat named Matt Seagal. I don't know if you're, you're familiar with him, yeah. but he had this, um, this video called Gene Gebser, uh, Integral Consciousness and the Eruption of Time. And time is one of my big things. Like, I've always been fascinated by time travel, time travel movies, and this just wrapping my head around the concept of time. So I said, this is something that's, that's, you know, combining my passion for integral and time together. And so I, you know, I immediately went out and bought the ever present origin, you know, and got it shipped and, and started reading it. And so, so Gebser, his whole enterprise is integral consciousness based around this idea of the concretion of time and understanding time better. So I, I was like, I was hooked from there. Right around 2008, I was like sitting out one day in meditation and, and I was like, you know, that, that natural feeling where your brain kind of like gears down. And I was like, wow, that's my brain waves kind of gearing down. Right. And, and so all of a sudden I was like, I wonder if the, the brain waves have anything to do with Gebser's structures of consciousness. And like, I got up from meditation and I went inside and I started doing research and, and through, through that research, I, I came to this conclusion that these, these structures, Ar Gebser's archaic, magic, mythic, mental, and the new integral were, were very, very tied to like cycles of the body, deep sleep, dream, waking, things like that. But they were also uh, tied to the brain waves. So the delta, the theta, alpha, beta brain waves kind of like matched up very nicely to, to Gebser's structures of you know, phenomenological structures of consciousness. And so I, I did a whole bunch of research and then um, wrote this paper called the gamma hypothesis, right? Which basically said that at the integral structure, there should be a core, a corresponding brainwave and like, like looking at the, the different like stages of brainwave development, gamma brainwaves were like right above the, the beta brainwaves. And I'm like, that has to, there has to be a link there. And what I realized is that get, there's a gamma coherence that, like it's a whole brain thing. Like, so it, so basically what gamma does is integrates the whole brain together. And I was like, boom, that's it. So I wrote this paper and I submitted it to the international gene Gebser society up in Hofstra in New York and they accepted it. So I went and um, presented the paper in 2008, 2000. Yeah. It was like, it was like winter 2008. I went up there and met a whole bunch of really cool Gebser people and uh, you know, met Jeremy Johnson during that time. I know you had him on your show. Um, and then just kind of ever since just been following that trajectory of like incorporating Wilbur, Gebser, um, you know, William Irwin Thompson, uh, Teilhard de Chardin, just to kind of get a whole rounded picture of what, to me, what integral looks like through the eyes. 
like I was more concerned, like less concerned with the, the maps and the representation and more concerned of like, like um, praxis and, and daily living. And, and what does it look like to see out of integral eyes? And so like, that's, what, that's basically, yeah. How does that concern show up in the uh, online project you're trying to get going here? The project began as an embodiment community. We were going to get together and we were going to create practices that, that explored human cultural origins. So to basically taking Gebser's ever-present origin, which is his magnum opus, taking the idea of origin and kind of like lifting it out and, and using that to, to say, let's, you know, if, we're going, if we want to know where we're going, we need to know where we've been. And so let's go back into the past and let's recreate uh, practices based around cultural, human cultural achievement, basically. And so like we were crafting practices like bread baking, where we would, we would get together and, you know, this was the plan, right? Prior to the pandemic, we were going to get together and we were all going to bake bread. But while we, were, while we were laying our hands on it, embodying the practice of baking bread, we were also going to talk about the history of bread. We were also going to, you know, talk about, you know, how cool it is that somebody invented yeast and, and what, what a wonderful, like, how, you know, how did that even come about? And, and then as a community, we were going to bake the bread together. Then we were going to sit down and we, as, as a group, break the bread together, thereby integrating the whole process, right? And so it was a way to explore history to embody a, a practice that has been, uh, you know, vital to, to human development, you know, breaking bread, eating bread, or the bread itself is just such a, such a core element of, of what it means to be human, right? And so bringing all that together was going to be like this huge integrated practice where we embodied as a community and enriched ourselves through cultural history. And then the pandemic happened. So, it was like, okay, we want to get together, create embodiment. And this was at a time where, you know, embodiment was huge, right? Like you, you could see it everywhere. It was, it was trending. It was buzz. We need to be less, you know, less mind oriented, less mentally focused and more in our bodies. But what, what, t- what, what happened is that that embodiment went to a pendulum swing where I started having people say things to me like, well, I don't want to think anymore. All I want to do is play. All I want to do is move my body. I don't care. You know, let's go to a five rhythms and let's just dance and not think. And I'm like, well, that's not integrative at all. Like you've got to, you know, you have to be able to incorporate the mind and the body and integrate those things if you're going to have any kind of. And so that was, that was a struggle. And then, like I was, like I was saying, the pandemic just kind of amplified that and created this, you know, I mean, a, socially distance, you know, like imperative where we had to be separate. We had to communicate through screens and, and we couldn't be around each other. And if we were, we had to be socially distanced with masks on. And, you know, and it was like, it, I took it personal. I took the pandemic rather personal because I mean, this was something that, you know, this was something that was uh, like, I felt was so necessary and so very much, you know, it was time, you know, and this was going to not to get too, you know, grandiose, but it was going to save us, you know, from, from the social media and from the disconnection and from the disembodiment. It was, it was the answer, right? And so, yes, we basically went online. The pandemic was a personal insult to your vision. <sighs> well, I mean, so like, th- think about it like this. Like, so, so for, for, <laughs> so for Gebser, right? Gebser's mental rational, right? Which is the structure where we're at right now, which is this, you know, like this very mentally focused, very disembodied, very disconnected, you know, polarized, you know, everything's separate, right? He was like, it's going to get worse and worse and worse until one of two things are going to happen. Either we're going to, you know, die as a species or, you know, that anxiety is going to catapult us into a new reality of, of integrated, you know, awareness. And so, you know, the, the ratio in the mental rational is this division of finer and finer and finer atomization. And you can see it in time where you went from seconds to milliseconds to nanoseconds and, and um, all the different you know, fields of research and academia and in industry are all more and more specialized and siloed. So you could kind of see it happening around the world. And then, and then two things happened. The pandemic happened absolutely, which was one of the most atomizing and, you know, sectoring things that could possibly happen to humanity. And then the second thing was Donald Trump, right? 
So Donald Trump came on the scene and I was like, you know, integral was in the back, on the back burner for me. It wasn't even like, you know, like I was still like very, very passionate about integral, but after, you know, after the implosion, you know, and the, and the diaspora that happened with the integral community, it was just like, well, this was, that was a cool idea, but now, you know, it's kind of like, you know, it's run its course and it just didn't happen. Right. And so like, you got to move on with life. And there was a, always a void there. There was always a pit, you know, like where I felt like I had found my people and then that they had just been ripped from me. Right. Like, so from 2011 to, to 2016, I was just, just living, you know what I mean? Uh, and then, and then Donald Trump happened and I was like, <laughs> Trump was a wake up call. Right. It was, it was, a, it was like a, it was a sign. It was a symbol. He was a symbol. And, and what I like to, what I like to say, no one ever gets the joke, but Donald, for me, Donald Trump uh, uh, symbolized the, the remainder of the unbalanced equation, right? This, this dude was the poster child for, uh, for egotism and narcissism. Like, like if you had to, if you had to like look at someone and say that, that it was the, you know, this person embodied the antichrist, then it would be Donald Trump because he's literally against anti everything that is good in the world. He's completely out for self, completely narcissistic, completely batshit insane. Right. And so I was like, Whoa, this is like, this is the sign. This is like, I was like, it's time. Right. And, and, and I've, I've actually had this conversation with many people that like, okay, 2016, something woke up, something woke up, uh, integral came back online in a huge way. And everybody started talking again. Everybody started making that push. And so like, I know I'm not alone in this endeavor of wanting to really make the push right now, because, you know, for, for people that have been in the integral community since the beginning, you know, integral was always the way, right. It, this was always supposed to happen. Even if, if, if it like got pushed off and pushed to the side for several years, it was like, it's the, it, for me, it's the solution. So it's my passion in life and that's what I'm doing. And I'm trying to like build community around it. I love the idea of revisiting practices from mm -hmm. previous stages. I think a lot of our higher vision suffers from not spending enough time embodying the previous stages and folding them in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I often think a lot about early mathematics, you know, about every six months, I think, I don't understand Leibniz well enough. So I started like getting in there and I think, you know, he called it the calculus because they used to do it with rocks. Mm -hmm. When I read that the first time I thought, God damn, what was math before there was paper? They were doing it in the dirt and they were doing it with rocks. Right. Why didn't I get any of that at school? Right. right. In a real ancient human embodiment of the underpinnings that help you understand what it is. So I love that. Well, I'm also interested in this brainwave stuff. I'm uh, curious about whether you um, have a sense of what practices help activate and integrate gamma waves, let's say. Okay. So, uh, okay. So it's been a long time since I've, um, since I've had this conversation, but I've literally just started having it again, strangely enough. Just, let me, before I get to that, let me just, let me, let me answer yeah. something that you were just saying that I got really excited about was that looking back into history and, and knowing the, like, our cultural origins, the origin story of math, of reading, of language, of all those things. That's really what, that's my passion right now. That's what fuels me on is being able to bring those things forward and say, this is the, this is how it began. This is where it is now, but this is the, this is the beginnings. And this is how we can make it better by incorporating that cultural, rich cultural history. But I just wanted to mention that because that was, that's really kind of core to what we do, right. Or to the, the, the general idea of, of cultural, we call it cultural embodiment, right? Like this idea of bringing it forward. Um, so as far as the, get, uh, the, the brainwaves go, um, you know, I met a lot of cool people at, at Gebser, at the GebserCon and, and had a lot of these great conversations. One, one lady that's really cool, Carrie Welch was doing uh, along the same lines, the same kind of research. And so like through, through like, you know, being able to like look at, you know, have all these interdisciplinary kind of like, angles you know not just the brain waves from the neuroscience perspective but but psychology and in you know, ecology and how we kind of like bring it all together um it created like this this really cool understanding of like phenomenology like direct experience like 
So like alpha brainwaves, right? It's a, it's a passive state. You're just kind of chilling. You're watching a movie, right? And you're, you're, you're receiving information, but there's no real critical thinking going on. There's just, it's just passive <clears throat> reception, right? And so that's kind of like that. But it's also like, if you look at it, it can, it can also be like docile or like, you know, like when it's, it's been proven that if you look at a, a video screen, your brainwaves and train to the video screen. So when you're looking at your phone and you're seeing those, you know, those, those waves coming in, it entrains you. And that's part of what gets you like, you know, that's part of what gets you locked into the screen because your brain waves are entrained. You're just passively receiving information. You know, every once in a while, something will piss you off and you'll uh, get, you'll get knocked out of it and you'll, you'll bust into some beta brain waves and you'll go, well, let me think about that for a second. And so when you're like actually trying to problem solve, that's when you go into beta, like a mental rational place. It's, it's your, you become alert, you know, you become, you become cognitive. You, you say, okay, this, there's a problem here. Now let's turn on the cognitive conceptual abstractional juices and let's solve it. Right. And so like being able to see the, how the different brain waves and how, how we like perceive reality through this electrical activity in the brain. And, and just the fact that, like uh, alpha brain waves are like centered, you know, in the occipital lobe, which is where our visual cortex is. And so like, there are also brain regions that, that, that loosely, you know, correlate to these brain waves, but there's always a global coherence, right? So what gamma does and what, okay, I don't want to say what it does because that's science. So what science right now is thinking that gamma does is this idea of temporal binding, right? And, so, and that's basically that, Whenever you're perceiving, you have thousands of, of sensory inputs coming in all at once, right? I got the lights from the lamp. I've got, I've got the green from your hat. I've got the sounds from the dog. I've got, you know, the taste of the coffee in the mouth. And everything's happening all at once. We're creating a cacophony of sensory, you know, stimulus. And our brain is incredible because what it does is it knits all that together into a nice, neat picture of reality, right? And what the knitting the electrical energy that knits it all together is a gamma brain waves. It's a, it's a ubiquitous brain wave that takes the visual sensory input and the audio sensory input and, and the tactile and all of that. And it creates a picture and it says, this is what we're experiencing right now. It's not separate things. It's not disparate parts all, you know, like disjointed, it becomes an integrated phenomenon. And that's the reality that we perceive. And so, and so on the, the low end, Gamma is already operating, creating a integrated perception of reality. And so I think this is where Gebser is really important because Gebser talks about time, right? And so when you're looking at how human beings perceive time, and I just posted a link on the group to this really cool, um, so it's a really cool book by James Kent. It was called Psychedelic Information Theory. And I read the book and he's got a lot of really, really great claims on um, uh, the, the, me the mechanical psychological mechanisms of that we, you know, of hallucinations in general, you know, like so psychedelic hallucinations. But in his book, he has this really cool theory that he calls temporal frame stacking, right? Where he, and, 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 I, and I've had several really cool conversations with him and we're kind of on the same page that, that the brain waves create like, you know, these, these, you know, slices because the, the hertz recycles per second, right? And so you're what you're doing is you're perceiving reality at a specific, you know, frequency, which which the brain waves. So if you're an alpha, you're you're literally receiving 24 frames or 24 hertz is which is what alpha is. And so 24 hertz per second is coming into your brain and you're literally perceiving, right? You're perceiving, especially if your visual cortex is where your main focus is. So if you're scrolling on Facebook, then you're really just into visual, right? And so that's what, that's your reality that you perceive. Uh, so gamma brain waves, uh, and so then also uh, beta brain waves are on the, on the, you know, are more like, 30 to 32 Hertz. And so there's a more of alertness, there's more awakeness, there's more going on in time to be knitted together, right? By the gamma brain waves. But that main brain wave that's like the beta brain wave is kicking you into a higher kind of like, and also there's a, you know, the neocortex is what you was what break what the, the beta brain waves use, right? And so when you're looking at time and you're looking at you know sensory input. The, the, the more the brain waves, you know, the higher the brain wave frequency, the more time you're getting in, the more uh, the, the, the quality increases, right? 
And so like, so the question when we were talking about gamma brainwaves was like, all right, what is, you know, like uh, gamma is like 40 Hertz up to a hundred. There's a range of gamma, right? And so like 40 Hertz is the low end, but you can like, you know, get up to a hundred Hertz. What does that, what does that look like for perception? What are you, what are you perceiving? Right. And so like, later on in the paper, I started, um, um, there was this study done by John Davidson where he took uh, experienced meditators and he would like put, you know, uh, EEG caps on them and like watch what happens to their brains when they meditated. And so all the studies basically showed that when these advanced meditators, 10,000 hours or more would meditate, they would, they would like produce massive amounts of gamma, upper, upper range gamma brain waves. And then, and then the experimenters would say, okay, what are you experiencing right now? And so like, so the meditators were meditating on compassion, right? So, okay, we're going to meditate on compassion. And what would happen is, is that these meditators would say that they became compassion. And so like this wall between, you know, subject and the object of meditation would, you know, like there would be, the wall would disappear and they would become that which they meditated on. Right. And so like, that had massive implications for, you know, for, for non-dual systems and for like, you know, different religious, you know, like people that were like, yeah, I'm one with everything. Right. Well, if you're, if you're, if you become one with what you meditate on, you know, that's kind of like, so yeah. I was like, that's really cool. The gap between subject and object is to some degree <clears throat> an artifact of the speed at which we're processing. That's a cool way to say it. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I mean, well, yeah, I mean, so, so Gebser, obviously, you know, like each one of the, the one of his structures of consciousness or stages, um, you know, had this, uh, from a phenomenological perspective, had a, a way that you saw the world, right? It's like, so for Gebser, uh, Gebser's definition of consciousness was how a human being perceives space and time, right? So space and time were key in Gebser's methodology. So like in the archaic, there was no subjectivity time and space didn't exist. He said, he would say that these were latent, right? They existed in the universe, but they weren't available to consciousness. They were basically sleepwalking, right? But the dreamless, dreamless, deep dreamless sleep is, is correlated with archaic. So if you take that and you move into magic, then all of a sudden there's this, you, you can feel the rhythms of nature, right? But space still doesn't exist. It's one dimensional, right? And so you move so on and forth. Um, you move through that mythic is a two dimensional circle. So the world is flat space doesn't exist because that's in a dimension above you. You have access to the cyclical nature to the cyclical time. That's where agriculture and civilization came from. That's also the birth of religion with two dimensional heaven and hell reincarnation, things like that. So you can see how the viewing of space and time or the perceiving or apprehending of it increased with each of these structures until you get to, you know, the mental structure, which is three dimensional, right? If it follows the mathematical progression, you have a past, present, a future length, width, and breadth of space, you know, a thesis, uh, antithesis, synthesis, everything is kind of like in three dimensional terms, right? We, we, we've spatialized. And so Getra says we've erroneously spatialized time as well into a past back there, present right here and a future up there. He said, that's a mistake. An integral will correct that by putting time into its uh, proper qualitative context. And if, if a proper qualitative context also includes, uh, you know, a new way of, of perceiving reality and gamma brainwaves plays a part in that, then that's really cool. That, that kind of knits the whole thing together and makes the phenomenological approach make sense. Yeah. It's a nice piece. The, the brainwave thing. I'm, I'm always a little bit hesitant to overlink brainwaves with other phenomena, but uh, two things are on my mind that really connect it to all this. The first is a study I read years ago saying that the dominant brainwaves are different for people at different periods of their lives. Mm -hmm. right? like young children, really young children are predominantly in delta waves when they're awake and they get a little older, they're predominantly in theta when they're awake, which is why that period of our memory is kind of murky and phantasmagorical. Right, yeah. 
And so if we're going through these dominant phases, it makes a lot of sense to ask what the next one is going to be, what should right. characterize our future waking consciousness. And yes. on the other hand, I think about this, there's a kind of dichotomy within Zen, right? Because there's people say the koan is a great example. What do you do with the koan? Is the koan something which allows your beta waves to slow down into alpha, or is it something that requires them to speed up into gamma, right? It, it is the point of the koan for you to let go of the discursive mind or to kind of overdrive it in a high performance mode? And mm -hmm. this gap you can find throughout all the Zen teachers. There's a kind of implicit argument within the field as far as I read it. Yeah. But I'm very intrigued by that because I think a lot of the 20th century take on meditative practice was to slow our problematic Western modern beta down into alpha and just be here and not think mm -hmm. and just gaze. And But there's this whole other side where the practice is a high performance practice where you gear up to what's beyond beta. So yeah. all of that stuff makes me very sympathetic to what you're suggesting about the relationship between brainwave speeds and Gebserian type developmental structures. Mm -hmm. Well, here's something, here's something really interesting, some research that I came across by a neuroscientist named Mark Beeman, all right? And you're going to want to look this cat up because Beeman was interested in um, epiphany, all right? He was interested in profundity, epiphany, and the aha moment, right? When the light bulb goes off. Mark Beeman wanted to know what happens when the light bulb goes off, when you get a, an intuitive spark, right? We, I, we've, we've all had it. We all know what it, what it is. And so Beeman started doing research, right, on doing brainwave research. And this was all during the 90s. There was this huge push for brainwave research. I mean, there was like it was everywhere. The emotive headset came out and they were tracking things. And I even got this for Christmas. I got this. Um, it was called the Jedi Force Trainer, where you, it was a little, a little like ping pong ball in a tube. And if you meditated, if you got your brainwaves down to alpha, this ball, you could raise the ball with your brain. And like, and it really worked. You could raise this whole thing up and down and control it. And I was like fascinated by this technology. And then it just disappeared. It all just disappeared in 2015 and just went away. And I was really sad about that. Anyway, so back, back, back to Mark Beeman. So Beeman started putting like, you know, EEG caps on people. And he was like, how do I, but how do you, how do you elicit the aha moment? What, I mean, how, how, you, how do you produce that? And so Beeman was like, jokes. The, the way in is laughter. And he was like, okay, if I can tell someone a joke and the second they get the joke, that should be, the, that's the aha moment, right? And, and your laughter is the, is the you know, physical response to, to, get, to getting the joke, right? And so Beeman set up this series of tests where he would like tell people jokes with the EEG uh, cap on. And like sometimes the people would get it, but when they got the joke, because like you, you you've been told jokes before and you don't quite get it. Right. And you're like trying to figure it out with your cognitive beta, beta mind. But then when you get it, everything just lights up and you friggin' you emote with laughter. Right. You know? And so like, lo and behold, whenever someone got the joke, it would elicit gamma brainwaves. Right. And so for Beeman, his research, the, the conclusion that he came to was that the aha moment, the, the, the second you get it, was, was, you know, preceded by gamma brainwaves. It didn't cause, the gamma brainwaves didn't cause the people to get it, but that's the global coherence that, the, that spark that, that happened was, was in the 40 to 100 hertz range. And so when you're talking about koans, right? A koan cannot be understood by the logical mind. You know, beta brainwaves, logical, conceptual, abstract thinking, it's A, if A, then B, and it's very, you know, it's very directed, right? There's, a, there's an outcome. It's not, you know, and so what koans are designed to do, you know, is take us out of the logical cognitive thinking mind and into the space of profundity, into the space of, of aha, right? And so, like, for me, I think that's, like, and again, it's a, it's a leap to say, but like a, a, a Satori experience, you know, if, if you're of the mind to believe in those things, is, a, is, is the snap of brainwaves. It's the aha, right? And so uh, ultimately what enlightenment would be, and along these same lines, is a continuous aha. Every, it's like getting the joke continuously for the rest of your existence, right? And, and so like, when I looked at spiritual traditions that would say, you know, reality is a joke. When you get it, 
you get it, right? And I was like, God, that is so poignant into in, in what we're kind of like researching here as far as brainwaves go. So anyway, but that's the beautiful book uh, by Arthur Kessler, who invented <sighs> the concept of the koan. Yeah. I mean, the whole on. Right. Uh, Kessler's book, The Act of Creation, mm. traces his model of the structure of insight, but he does it as scientific discovery, artistic innovation, and humor. So the book's divided into three sections, examining the same um, structure of the bifurcation of concepts into a model that contains too much energy for the regular mind to grasp. Ah, so it's a very it, yeah. nice uh, look at that same kind of thing. And I, what I like about framing it as a bifurcation is that it brings forward this idea that is really essential to Wilbur's version of integral thinking, which is the interconnecting or the splicing of perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that's one of the interesting things. That, that's a Wilberian emphasis. Uh, right. Gensler's version doesn't necessarily think about perspective splicing as much. Mm. Like it's, it's implicit in there. But what I want to do is reverse that and say, what do you think Gebster's explanation brings to us that Wilbur's explanation doesn't do justice to well enough? Yeah. So Gebster was an artist and a poet, right? And, and in the 30s, he was hanging out with artists and poets. He was hanging out with Rilke and Lorca and, you know, like Picasso. And, and he actually did a lot of work with Picasso on Picasso's concretion of time through his artwork, right? Yeah. Um, what was your question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this out, please. Yeah. Um, you were talking about, okay, what Wilbur didn't, what Wilbur, what, yeah, where Wilbur's why, model. Why Gebser in addition to reading Wilbur. Okay. So, um, and so, and so Gebser was looking at the phenomenology of consciousness through the lens of, of perspective and, and specifically in art. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, so Gebser begins his book with the three worlds and he calls them the unperspectival, the perspectival, and then the aperspectival. Right. And so this is where it kind of comes back to the space and time thing. Right. In the unperspectival, we didn't, we, there was no perspective of time or space. Right. And, and that would, and that brings us to the archaic and the magic up to the mythic, because in the mythic space was still flat. All the artwork represented two dimensional, right. Images of the world. The angels stood at the four corners blowing their trumpets, but there was, there was no dimension of space in the mental rational the discovery of space occurred because for the first time you had an ego subject in here uh, with an out there world, right? An objective world that all of a sudden we could measure. And that's where the sciences come from. We started measuring everything, even the interior of the body, we started measuring. And so perspective and Leonardo obviously, you know, perfected this idea of the vanishing point, right? Where, where there's, there's a subject in here and we're looking to the vanishing point, which is the horizon. But in a temporal sense, the vanishing point is also our death, you know, the end of things, the, the, the finality, that the, the major thing. And that's what's causing uh, most of the anxiety or the existential anxiety right now. So the unperspectival for the archaic, the magic, the mythic, the perspectival, right, for the mental. And this is, you know, spatially oriented and, and which is great. You know, we again, the sciences are fantastic, but there's. There's always an efficient and a deficient aspect in Gebser structures, right? You, you go up and up and up, you plateau for a little while, and then you descend down into hell again, right? And right now we're in perspectival madness, right? Everything's so sectored, so divided, so, so atomized that we're all separate now. We're, we've forgotten that we're together, that we have a, you know, all these things. So Gebser's antidote to that and what differs in Gebser's approach versus say Wilbur is instead of going to from perspectival to say multi-perspectival, which is still more sectoring on and on into a post, 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 post thing. Gebster says we're moving into an a perspectival understanding and orientation to the world. And so, so Gebster, Gebster has this little, little a, right. And he uses it for a thousand words, right. His, his version of A is alpha privativum, which means liberation from. So the, the A prefix usually like in the term a causal for a Jungian, right, would be the, you know, the negation of cause, right? So that's alpha negativum. So instead, Gebs is using the Latin alpha privativum to liberate us from the idea without obliterating it, which is the kind of the key to, to Gebser's whole realization that previous structures don't need to be transcended 
they needed to be folded in and, and, you know, like they're always ever present, right? At the ever present origin. And so what, or what a perspectival does is instead of taking the subject in here, locking it in to a world out there, which causes alienation, we liberate ourselves from perspective. The center becomes everywhere. The circumference becomes nowhere. And now all of a sudden we, instead of seeing the one and the many, there's just wholeness, right? We situate ourselves within wholeness and the conversation that we're having now is takes on a whole different meaning because we're not two separate individuals having this conversation, there is a connected collaborative process. And then the process becomes what's important for Gebser, right? And so, and so yeah, that's the big difference is that a multi-perspectival, a, a third person, fourth person, fifth person, sixth person perspective for Gebser is just more atomization. It's more of that division and that ratio that we're attempting to extract ourselves from, right? So, so in Gebster's writing, he's ridiculously, uh, you know, he places a lot of emphasis on language, on the nuance of language, on the etymology of language and, and the words that we use that create our world. Like, like uh, for instance, lately, I've been having a lot of conversations between the idea of oneness and wholeness, right? People conflate the two words and they're like, yeah, oneness, right? And I'm like, <laughs> no, there's, this, there's a world of difference between oneness and wholeness, right? So for the magic structure, one dimensional identity with the world is, is, is our orientation, right? Identity with leaves no room for differentiation, right? It is an amalgam. It's a, you throw all the paint together and get that weird brown color. That's what, you, that's what you're looking at, right? And so like, honest to God, I did not understand the concept of, of oneness until I saw a Rick and Morty episode. <laughs> and so there's this, there's this episode called Unity. I, I really suggest you check it out because... <clears throat> Are you familiar with Rick and Morty? I love the show. Yeah, it's a great show. I haven't seen episode of uh, season four yet, but I'm looking really, I'm looking forward. I'm kind of like holding off until the timing is right. I need something in my life. <laughs> anyway, so like in season, whatever it was, there was this episode called Unity, right, where Rick is dating this planet, right. The entire planet is called Unity, and every single being on the planet is Unity, right. It's it's like there's they're they're all acting out through her. Right. And so like you go all, all these things where she's making everybody do these crazy, weird, you know, orgies and like huge parties. And everybody's getting really tired because they're all her. Right. The, yeah. There's one unified identity and she's it. Right. And I'm watching that going. That's the that's the, the difference between oneness and wholeness. Right. And oneness is one dimensional flat. There's no differentiation. Everybody's identical. Right. But in wholeness, you, you, you have the capacity for infinite, infinite differentiation and creativity. And that's where, that's what, that's where creativity comes from is the, is the differences. Right. And so like, along with cultural, you know, appreciation, we also look at, you know, uh, diversity and, and, and differentiation and uniqueness and, and, and honor all those things because it takes the whole to create the most robust and beautiful picture of reality. Right. And so that's what a perspectival does. That's the difference between oneness and wholeness, right? That's why language is important. And that's where, you know, that's where, that's what we're trying to do. here. That's, so that's what I'm trying to do. You know? <laughs> uh, I really like the topic of time as well. And, yeah. you know, from my limited understanding of Gebser, I feel like he has a couple of different ways of enfolding time into our perceptions one which is built into all kinds of integral models, which is sort of seeing or being aware of the developmental history of the things that you're encountering. And then also of the, the latent futures that are currently present in what we're beholding. So those are two interesting ways of embedding time in our current perception. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about um, what's your take on how Gebser holds the finite and the eternal together? Right? Because there's a sense in which a perspectival is a leap beyond the, the framings of time that are given to us by our mental function. But there's another sense in which the mental function itself created a, a metaphysics of eternity as like the ultimate frame for linear thinking and mm. divorced us from a real deep appreciation of what's finite and what's temporal. Yeah. So how, how, does, well, how does your take on Gebser balance the finite and the infinite? Yeah. Well, you know, I don't, I, I don't recall Gebser ever using the term eternal, right? Um, 
I, I think, um, you know, I, because I have such a, um, a rich and, you know, intimate history with time and like, you know, I've been studying it for years and it's become like my major focus for 2020. Cause uh, you know, 2020, <laughs> certain communities are calling 2020 time soup, right? There's like days and weeks meant nothing. Days of the week meant nothing. Hours of the day meant nothing. People wore their pajamas and it became this on running joke, right? Ongoing joke for the whole year that it was just a time soup. And that was, so that was also like an indicator that, that like Gebser, you know, Gebser's ideas about the concretion of time, which, which I'll unpack that um, a, a, for the integral structure was this idea that, you know, um, Linear time, this this idea of you know like this future oriented t- t- uh, telos, right? This future point, this uh, that's where uh, Gebser and, and Teilhard kind of like you know parted ways with was he was like no, there's not a telos, there's not a direction because directional thinking is mental rational, it's spatial thinking. There's something out there, and I think Gebser would feel the same way about the differentiation between uh, you know finite and you know e- eternal. Uh, these are, you know, like mutually exclusive, mutually implicative categories, right? To, to pull from Whitehead, you know, like uh, nature and spirit, you know, absolute and relative are all, you know, mutually implicative. You can't have one without the other, right? And so in, as far as linguistics go, um, any, any term that, you know, uh, you know any term that, that favors one or the other is, is logically, you know, stupid. So anyway, um, this idea that, Gebser brings in this term called a dual, right? Uh, and a dual is uh, different from non-dual. Uh, non-dual has this weird linguistic connotation where if you say not to, you're implying something else, right? There's, the, there's a linguistic implication that there's something else that you're not implying. Where uh, for Gebser, uh, a dual, which is the liberation from, liberation from duality, kind of solves that by saying, well, you can have oneness and you can have polarity, two-ness, you can have, you know, duality, which is three-ness, and you can also have, you know, a deliberation from those things. And it doesn't mean that, you know, it, you're, you know, you're in a non-dual space. It means that you have access to, you know, this particular version of space and time, this one and this one, and they're all integrated in to what we refer to as integral consciousness. Um, and so in that regard, integral is less of a structure, it's less of a stage. And it's more of uh, what I call an aperture, right? It's, it's this field that allows, you know, allows the light, you know, allows all of this to kind of like percolate up into it and, you know, and be together, right? So, and so like, so Gebser uses words like a mention, right? Which is the, the liberation from dimension, because even if you think in terms of, you know, two-ness, right? You're, you have this idea of a dimension being, you know, either that way or that way, because the die is two, right? And so Gebser says, you got to even go beyond that kind of thinking and think in terms of uh, liberation from dimension itself, which means that all the dimensions are ever present, all the structures are ever present, and all time is ever present, right? So, so Gebser looks at time, and he says, well, we have timelessness in the unperspectable, in the archaic. We have, you know, what one dimensional time, rhythmicity of the, you know, like the rhythms of nature, right? We have access to that. We have uh, the polar, you know, obviously the cyclical nature of time where we can you know, see the seasons like we were talking about earlier. We can, you know, and they gave, they gave us agriculture, right? It's, it's necessary. It's, and if we recognize it, and utilize the efficient aspects of it and bring those things forward and ground those things into our present reality, then we have access to all structures of time. Even mental rational time is not a bad thing, right? It's sectored, spatialized, past, present, and future is still very, very much. We use it every day when we look at our watch, right? But that's not the whole story. You know, it's, it's what Wilbur's partial truth, right? So for Gebser, in, in integrating all those together, it gives us a freedom from any one of those, right? We don't do away with them. We don't regress, but we, we bring them, you know, and like really dive as deep as we can into them. So, so yeah, so I've, I've been evoking a lot of Einstein lately, right? Because Einstein said, uh, you know, the difference between past, present, and future is a persistently stubborn illusion, right? And, and Gebster talks about Einstein a lot is Einstein had his finger on the pulse of this atemporal, right? This freedom from time, uh, that allows us to con- concretize time in the integral. And then, you know, 
Uh, also, Einstein says that space and time are not modes in which we live, but by you know, space and time are not things in which we live, but modes by which we think. Right. So like, so we're like the, the, the way we think about time and the way we think about reality and, and the moments, you know, are more important than, you know, than does space actually exist? Does time actually exist? Right. So, so yeah, to get back to your question about finite and eternal, I think that's a dualism that the Gebser would say, you know, I don't know. Um, because he, when he talks about origin, right, which is originary presence, it's, um, Oh, Cynthia Bourgeau had a really great way of explaining it in her last blog. I don't know if you're familiar with Cynthia, but she's been doing uh, uh, Gebser lessons. Um, I'll have to send you the website, but it's all over Jeremy's Mutations Facebook if you want to uh, check that out. But she was talking about Gebser's, you know, talking about origin and, and how, you know, origin exists outside of space and time. It's not linear. It's not anything that we think of as being directed. It's not a beginning. It's not an end because those things exist in space and time. What it is, it's, it's, the orig it's the ground, right? It's the originary presence that shines through the artifice, right? It's, it's the shining through. And that's part of that aperture, right? It's, it, it gives us access to all of, all of the origin. Everything is, that was latent prior and separated from us is now fully transparent to us. We have access to the whole thing, man. And that's wholeness, right? That's, that's what we're talking about. So from unconscious archaic, right, completely deep sleep to the wakefulness of the mental structure to the clear light, the transparency of the integral structure that gives us access to all space and all time, where we realize that past, present, and future are persistently stubborn illusions, right? And, and, and that we are, I guess you call us eternal beings, you know, because we exist in all space and all time, because that's kind of like our, that's our thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah i love thinking about um authentic mystical progress as being the opposite of how we've traditionally discussed it you know because mm -hmm. there's a sense for a long time in the modern age there was a sense of we're going to escape from the temporal by letting it go and returning to the timeless even people who weren't exactly doing that in their practice spoke about it in those terms. But right. there's this other way to think about it where each of these phases has actually got more time in it. Mm -hmm. And that there's a more time that exceeds what we currently think time is. And that's eternity like without yeah. being a regression. Right. And exactly. I love yeah. that you brought up Einstein because he was so deep into understanding how the universe has to be processed relationally, relativistically. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. One of the things that comes up in my mind relative to time is the image of a surfer. And when the surfer is riding the wave, he's not moving relative to the wave. They're constant together, but they're actually in motion. Right. So sometimes I feel like when I was a kid, I thought my experiences of eternity were of eternity. Yeah. Now I can equally well think of them as maybe I was just, moving with time so well that it did not seem to be moving relative to me, yeah. <laughs> which would involve yeah. a faster, more coordinated set of firing impulses. Yeah. Now uh, Einstein has a word for that. He calls it the equivalence principle. You know, when we're moving in an elevator and we, we don't feel like we're moving, that's the whole, the whole, the whole thing about relativity, man. And that's why I'm like, I've always been a fan of Einstein, even though I, you know, wrapping your head around Einstein is, is a, an integral practice in itself. Right. Um, but yeah, um, I've had those moments too, you know, where, where like everything felt timeless, you know? And, and so that was like, so for Gebser, that's cool. Yeah, you do that, you know, feel into that and just know that that's part of the process. That, that, that's part of who you, you know, what you have access to. Um, lately, there's a, there's a really great paper and I'm, 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 I've got so much going on right now, I can't get through it, but it's um, Michael Purdy, who is a, a Gebser scholar. Uh, he's a professor, um, I can't remember the, university teaches that, but he's on, he's in our group. And he wrote a paper called, you know, of Lincoln Gebser and synchronicity. Right. And, and it was very synchronous. I, I was looking at that paper and then Jeremy posted something about the acid left and, and, you know, this, this uh, app that, that tries to recreate synchronicity is called rando. Um, don't quote me. I'll, I'll figure it out later, but, but yeah, like, so, so the, the idea of synchronicity has been coming up, up a lot for me lately. And I was like, and, and, and Gebser ties it to the, you know, to the magic structure when everything was one, you know, when, when we had, we had like a group ego, 
and we're trying to make sense of the world and we were interacting with each other and everything was meaningful coincidence, right? And so like it even brings in synchronicity into the conversation of time, which, which I feel is like, you know, because I always wondered like, what is, what is, because I've, I've experienced synchronicity. I've, I've experienced so many of them and they're so wonderful to me, right? They're so meaningful to me and I light up every time it happens. I go, where is that in, this, in, in Gebser's you know, what, where, where do you situate that in these structures? And Purdy does it very, you know, very elo eloquently when he says it's, it's right there in the magic structure, you know, um, it's part, is how we experience timelessness, you know, because if, if all of these things are happening that are so randomly, you know, seemingly un, you know, uncoordinated and, and, and we make meaning out of them, that is uh, us accessing timelessness in that regard. And it's just, I don't know, that's fantastic. That's been happening a lot lately. There's a kind of juxtaposition or dualism in a lot of integral type thinking about how many of our functions are just part of us forever and mm -hmm. how many of them are emergent and new. Uh, and so yeah. when you think about the, the great sages of previous epochs of humanity, do you, you know, do you think of them in the Gebserian sense as expressing the, that, those integral opening that aperture you were talking about? Were they doing it then in their system? Or is it something that's emerging at the front end, so to speak? Or are those somehow the same? <laughs> so so this, is a really, this is a really good point. And this is a really fine, this is a really fine point. But this is where, this is where a lot of developmental systems and Gebzerian system kind of like part ways, right? So, so development, like when you were, when you were saying about the, the, the Delta and the beta brain waves in children, right? There was this, um, my original research was, you know, I called the gamma hypothesis a phylogenetic developmental theory, right? Which basically is if, if we have like, if, if we come up in the archaic and the magic and the mythic in our personal development, then the entire species had a lockstep development, you know, a linear developmental, you know, trajectory until now. And that's, that becomes problematic. And when you think, when you're thinking about, um, you know, like indigenous cultures, you know, who had like, or I, I posted something the other day and I'll, I'll link you to it about the pyramids. Right. So it was this, this thing where I, you know, well, I know this is killing us and this is all this hard work, but one day people would really appreciate all the time and the technical acumen that we put into this. And the bottom picture was a lady looking at the pyramids going, yeah, that was aliens. Right. Because we don't think that, that we, we feel like human beings are the pinnacle of technology and, uh, and of like innovation and, and how could a previous barbaric, you know, like simple tribe of people craft something like the pyramids that we, you know, with our current technology cannot reproduce, right? That becomes a huge problem if you're, if you're steeped in a developmental model, right? Because, and, and then what also it does is it takes those previous structures, right? The, the magic, the indigenous tribes, and it, and it puts them in, in, in line with like infantilism, right? And a childlike developmental state. And we, and we can't, we don't, we, we tend to not give them the credit and the, you know, the, you know, that they deserve, right. From, for their, for what they were doing during their time. So, so that brings it back to that question that you asked as far as could integral people have existed, you know, um, way back when. And, and the answer is, is, you know, adamantly yes. Right. Uh, Zhuangzi, if you've ever read the writings of Zhuangzi, Zhuang, Zhuangzi was integral AF, man. It was like, he was so far ahead of his time as far as, you know, his writings and his mystical experiences and, and the A duel, right. He was really, really tied into that. Um, uh, uh, Dogen, Dogen, 13th century, um, I've got a, I've got a, a article and a, the actual text of the Uji. All right. I don't know if you're familiar with the Uji, but the Uji is um, Dogen Zinji's treatise on time and more specifically the time being. Right. And so he used this, this really cool turn of phrase called for the time being. Right. Which, which, you know, which is not is a cool turn, like um, aphorism we use now, but what he was basically saying in the 13th century was all being is time and time is all being, right? And this lines up smack with Gebser because Gebser says this idea of the concretion of time, 
we can become time, all right? So that every single movement and every orientation that we make in this world is affecting the whole, right? And that puts the personal responsibility and the onus on us to make the right moves in this world, literally, because all being is time and time is all being. And so I've created a, a really great practice, a personal practice around perceiving myself as the time being, right? But not, not just I am the time being, but all beings are time beings, right? Because we're all affecting each other's actions in everything we do. You know, that's where, um, for chaos theory comes from. You flap up a butterfly, flaps its wings, it creates, you know, havoc on the other side of the world, right? And so you have, you have these very brilliant people that came out of our past that, that were speaking and thinking and, and acting integrally. And, and, and so there's no real, like, so you, it, the developmental model becomes very, um, you know, like it's still important. It's, we still use it. We can still use it, but being able to kind of like see, you know, like use what Gebser calls transparency to see through these structures and to see through our history, to be able to see, how these things were kind of like operating even in a time prior to ours that we don't, you know, it's just a, it's just a change of mentality, really. The time being is a beautiful uh, phrase. Uh, it, what came into my mind was a, was a whole cluster of interrelated things. I do cold showers as a health practice. Mm -hmm, yeah. uh, took me a while to be capable of doing it for more than a few seconds. And instrumental, that process was slowing down my responses to the shock of cold, trying to be more, um, just slower and more present with it. Mm -hmm. And that led into my reconsideration of what Nietzsche meant by affirming the eternal recurrence. Now, mm -hmm. I don't want to say that elves told me this, but that's <laughs> kind of what happened. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I understood the affirmation of the eternal recurrence as the as embodied intending of the indefinite duration of each movement and moment and thing. You, you will the eternity or just the, the indefinite extension of each moment and movement. Mm, and it's a beautiful. really it's so beautiful, beautiful practice. And yeah. it makes you feel like your being is non-different from what time is. Uh, yeah, that, that was, say that again, that, that phrase that you said, had said in the middle. <laughs> Which one? The, I was like the indefinite. Uh, to, yeah, to intend the indefinite extension of each moment and move. Oh, God bless. That is beautiful. Yeah. 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 If, if that's what Nietzsche was saying, then I'm in totally. Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> I've had some really good conversations with some people about Nietzsche. And, you know, like and Nietzsche, Nietzsche factors in very importantly into Gebser's work because of the Ubermensch, you know, and, and, and all that, but I, I, I man, I haven't, I haven't studied Nietzsche nearly enough. You know? He has a he has a short piece on time called the the use and abuse of history for life, <sighs> and he talks about three different modes of social perception of time, and one of them is the super historical mode. So that might be of interest to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The uh, use so, and abuse of history for life. Right. Yeah, we uh, we talked about this fine point relative to emergence and development and histories and futures there's yeah. a similar question i want to ask which is around you mentioned the kind of uh, divergence of ways between de chardin and gebser relative mm -hmm. to the telos yeah uh, and that's one way of thinking about the telos we can also think about the telos as that which as the wholeness that is implicit in each thing mm -hmm. that draws us forward towards towards what already is right and so around that i'm thinking about you know, this ever-present origin. To what degree is the ever-present origin something that actually has always been with us in the same way? Mm -hmm. And to what degree is it a novelty? Mm -hmm. To what degree is it, you know, because there's something about synchronizing and converging that looks like moving toward a point, and there's something that looks like uh, that point is what was always already here. Yeah, yeah, man. That's really, that's really poignant. Um, you know, so yeah, so Gebser, you know, like the, the problem that Gebser had with, uh, with uh, Teilhard, when he, again, he loved Teilhard's work, but it was just that one progression, right? So, so Gebser, Gebser, you know, like in, in his later writings started talking about evolution, but in his earlier writings, Gebser wouldn't use the word evolution, right? Because evolution was directed towards you know, tw some future complexified thing, right? And so it was this building of more and more and more complexity until you reached, 
you know, perfection, which is what, which is what, you know, for, um, Teilhard, you know, the telos was, it was the, it was the perfection into, you know, his, in that, that moment, right. The, the instantaneous, you know, perfection of humanity. And so, and so for Gebser, I'm like, that's, that's time oriented, right. It, it comes back to time because, um, each, each progression, right. And we're all about some progress here, you know, like, you know, with the uh, progressive politics and progressing into a better future for Gebser, uh, each progression, was also a move away from origin. Okay. And so, and so origin is this ever presence, right? It doesn't exist in space or time, right? It, but it, 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 it creates space and time, right? It is like, is ever the word in German is ersprung, right? And so there's this springing forth, this, this, you know, like, um, into manifestation, right? It's the originary light that, that is the ground of being, right? And then, and I've, it's taken me 12 years to wrap my head around just the idea of origin itself, and I'm still not there, right? I'll be honest with you. It's one of those things where you cannot grasp with the rational mind. It has to be experienced, you know, from the whole. Uh, and so, and so, yeah, Gebser was like, yeah, this telos is a move away from originary presence, so, so I said earlier in the archaic structure, the archaic is literally um, synonymous with origin, right? But it's, it's biblical paradise in a sense, right? But it's completely unconscious, right? So if, you, if you're like in paradise, but you don't know it, is it paradise? You know, if you don't have any subjective experience of it, what is there, right? And it's the same thing in deep dreamless sleep. We, we go through it every single night, but we're not aware that, and, and some, you know, like Indian traditions, they would meditate and go down into these states and they would say that the deep dreamless sleep state is nirvana. That's where it's, the action is, right? You move through the dreams, you move through the sleep stages and you go down into deep dreamless delta wave sleep. And that's where, you know, that's heaven. That's, that's the, you know, the infinite eternal. Um, and so, so there are correlations to that, but, but again, the archaic unconscious synonymous with origin, right? You look at consciousness, right? You're looking at, at um, something that's waking up, right? So imagine like coming out of deep dreamless sleep and then waking up in the morning, you're groggy, you still have access to the dream state, you know, you're, you're moving slow. And then once you get that cup of coffee in you, you start moving a little faster and then you, you wake up, right? And then all of a sudden now here we are, we're awake. I've had probably nine cups of coffee now. And I am completely awake and cognitively focused here and, and, and wakefulness is happening. Right. And so there's that, there's that stage progression between deep sleep and complete wakefulness that is indicative of cycles of the body It's indicative of all of these structures as well. Every single time we're moving away from that uh, origin, right. We're moving away from it because the magic's a move away. Every, every bit of complexity is a move away from the originary presence. So because Gebser is integrative, right? Because his whole thing is integration, like if you move from the completely unconscious origin and archaic, the integral has to be also synonymous with origin, but completely conscious, right? And so, and so that's where this idea of latency and transparency comes in. All these things were available to consciousness, right? They're all pre-existing. Everything in the universe is there, all right? All time, all space, it's boom, it's there. But we don't have access to it phenomenologically, consciously. We don't have access to the space and time and the magic and in the mythic structures. But now in the myth, in the mental, we have access to space. We have access to time. We have access to all those previous things. Some of those things dropping back into latency, like telepathic abilities, right? But prior to language, we communicated as one solid group ego. Look at a murmuration of crows, you know, like that's this, this idea of group ego and we all communicated through this telepathic ability, whatever that looks like. Gebster says, if, when we come online to integral, all that becomes transparent to us. So complete occlusion to complete transparency in the integral structure. That's also complete access to origin again, because again, you can't have differentiation when there's an a-dual integral structure. So what that looks like is what we're what's kind of unfolding that right now and what I'm trying to you know, write about and codify and have conversations with others about. So, so to bring all that back to Teilhard, it's not a progression away from, it. it's the same thing. It's just com from completely unconscious to conscious of the thing in itself, right? So yeah, there's a difference between perceiving stages as, 
as a spatial movement, which is a movement toward, but also a move away from. And right. this other thing of conceiving stages as phases of the clarification of what's always already given. Exactly, right. Getzer was really adamant saying, hey, yes, there's, an, uh, there's a mathematical unfolding from zero to one to two to three dimensional, but don't look at it linearly. Even though, even though that's what it's doing, that's still a product of you know, linear thinking. And, and what we're doing is we're going a linear, right? Not nonlinear, not like the absence of linearity, not linear, but like the, the freedom to, come, to get outside of the spatial temporal directed thinking of the mental rational. And so like, so it's, it's really, oh, language sucks, man, because it's really hard to wrap your head around these things because we're talking conceptually. It's yeah, way, be, so way easier to there's experience. There's a critique of Teilhard even though I don't think Teilhard's depth is, uh, you know, limited by that critique, but that that sense of development is itself a little bit misleading. And that same kind of critique can be made of a lot of the way Wilbur describes it as well. Mm. Uh, I've done some work around what I call the coaxial model, where instead mm. of thinking of the first tier stages and then the second tier stages in the same direction, you think of them as perpendicular. So you've got all these developmental phases in the linear mode, where they're increasingly differentiating themselves over time, but there's this perpendicular dimension, which is the deployment of the integrative capacity at any of those stages. Yeah. So it, that potential and that path is always available at all yeah. those moments. Right. And, and that's like, so like, so what the way I would describe that, and that's so beautiful that you said that is like, you know, um, if, if we'll, uh, you know, if the stages are, are horizontal, you know, or actually vertical, you know, like, cause, cause they're like hierarchical and, you know, complexity and growth and progress and everything else. If you look at them horizontally, you know, laid out, uh, you can see that they all are ever present and coexisting. You know, there's uh, co-substantive, right? Like the archaic, the magic, the mythic are in each one of us and being able to summon those, you know, those things uh, is, is, is key to the practice. So, so I mentioned earlier, we, you know, there's a practice we use called cultural embodiment, but there's two axes to our practice. There's cultural embodiment, which is the human expression and origin and bringing all that forward. But then there's also the structural embodiment on the other axis. And that's where, where we really kind of tease apart these structures. And, and they're, you know, like whether you look at Gebser structures or, you know, spiral dynamics or anything else, they all line up, right? Uh, Gebser didn't uh, have a, a red stage, right? But he also said that, you know, some of these stages could be, you know, some of these structures could be broken down, you know, because they're the time frames are millions of years from the archaic to the magic. Right. We're not talking about like, you know, like two years from now, we're talking about a long time. Right. And so there could have been like, you know, more differentiation in this in these structures. But he just like broke down the, you know, the archaic magic mythic and mental as the basic, you know, structural facets. But yeah, that's the, um, the idea of looking at these structures as all ever present and, and coexisting, you know, and then taking the, the those most efficient aspects of all those structures and grounding them in the present, right? So that, that means that the, the efficient aspects of how we view space and time, how we operated our subjectivity, you know, because in the mythic, we were a we, right? We were a collective we and the, 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 uh, the individual didn't exist yet, right? And so like we were, we were operating for the community, we were operating for, you know, and that's, and so those, those are still very, very important aspects to our humanity that if we just throw the baby out with the bathwater, we're going to get rid of and, and just, you know, reduce to traditionalism and, and say, no, we can't have that. And that's where blue shadow comes from and green shadow and all of these different, like, you know, separate, you know, kind of like um, pathologies come from, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm full of shit, man. I'm really am. Yeah. It's true, but I love conversations mm. like these. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So yeah, and that's why that's why I love the I love your idea of the um the perpendicular, man. Yeah, that, that works. Because you know, the Buddha didn't allow women into the flock, man. And so like there there has to be some, you know, there, there has to be a little bit more on the on the growth side because that's what, and I think that's where developmental, you know, like thinking is still very much important because you're looking at the Buddha the enlightened one you didn't like women what was that you know like and so like there's you know there's there's something more to it you know there's something more to be uncovered yeah there's a there's a danger in the in the linear progress model but there's also yeah. danger in the return model and i think the danger in the return model is a failure to distinguish 
pre and trans or what, what we were saying people who want to escape the problem of the modern mind by regressing <laughs> to a pre-modern political condition or an yeah. alpha brainwave state versus yeah. those who want to make that next move to solve those problems oh yeah yeah i think it was uh, uh cynthia Bourgeau's lesson number six where she w- went off on traditionalism and how it was a rejection of modernistic values and how it was a regression and and again, Gebster says that that's the main pathology is this regression. You know, like we we have fought through hell to get to where we are with a solid ego, with a solid modern scientific rational worldview. Why the hell would you throw that out now? You know, like if, if you can build on, if you can incorporate and integrate that into into the what it means to be human and then some, you know, that's that's more of a, you know, a healthy project. And that doesn't, you know, like preclude anything or, or regress it and, and, and make you blind to it. You know, it makes everything transparent, you know. You mentioned Trump as a kind of, uh, you know, a sign, a symbol, an omen, an embodiment mm-hmm. of a problem that activates a lot of people to seek, seek for solutions. Yeah. And at the same time, I know that there's a number of Gebser people like Jeremy Johnson who are strong supporters of the integral left and the kind of a progressive political shift. Mm-hmm. What's your take on how these kinds of ideas play out on the political stage? What's what's a Gebsarian politics for the 21st century? <laughs> <laughs> you have two minutes to answer. <laughs> that's what you thought me, Layman, okay? Um, you know, so because of, because I'm okay so I, I hate politics man I think politics is such a, a sham system it's a dualistic you know there's a um, back in the day there were, in the integral life circles there were the 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 six political you know what was it the six political you know categories you know you had like you know far far right and then center right and then like you know a little bit you know towards the left and then to the orange and and there were all of these different phases of transitions of political structure for for what Gebser does do in his book which is cr- create a a religious movement that that deals with the present that he calls preligio that does not future oriented into some heaven is some transcendent space but is right here right now it's present oriented all right he created uh, b- beyond philosophy which is a representation of forms a spatial representation of the thing he call he talks about etiology which is integral being in truth what we see is becomes true for us, right? Tim Porix is the multidimensional study of time and how we can, you know, concretize time in the integral structure and, and really, you know, um, you know, be able to be in the world together. He has all these different integral, you know, like methodologies and that you could do entire, you know, academic courses on. He doesn't talk about politics. He doesn't, he doesn't have anything that he mentions that is like, that is an integral political thing, right? Uh, he talks about liberation and he talks about wholeness. And I think that, you know, and so I can't answer for him because he's dead, obviously. But, you know, it, and it's something that I've also kind of like shied away from because uh, uh, politics is power moves, you know, it's, it's, it's power is control over. And one of Gebser's like, you know, main things is that, you know, at the integral structure, power no longer, you know, is important because you realize that, that larger truth of, you know, and, and so like, he doesn't really have an answer for that. And, and, and I, and of course, I don't want to come off like I parrot everything that Gebser says, and then I'm a Gebser fanboy, which I totally am. But like, I, I kind of feel the same way about politics and that it's limited and that it's divisive and that it is like, um, right now it's, it's completely like, not cool. And so like when Jeremy came out with the integral left, you know, I like linguistically speaking, I was like, Whoa, dude, you're, you know, you're, you're going integral left. You know what I mean? Like, and you're not looking at an integration and, and, and also centrism sucks because that's not an integration that is just a, you know, uh, pulling to the middle. Um, and so like, there's, there's big, huge problems, right? Huge problems. Um, I remember when I was most excited was when, you know, like, Bill Clinton was reading Wilbur, you know, and, and I was, I was like, wow, things are going to really change now because we have somebody who's integrally informed in office. And, and there was a lot for a long time. I thought Obama had the same, same kind of integral bent to him, you know, because he wasn't divisive and he did talk about, you know, holistic policies. And, and so, and then, you know, 
things came out afterwards that he wasn't, the, you know, the, the president. He did, you know, have a lot of people killed. And and so I'm like, I don't know, man. Like that, that one's that one's a sticking point for me. And it's tough to talk about because I don't like politics. I hate politics. I, I call myself apolitical for a long time until I saw that meme of like, well, if you're, you know, if you don't engage in politics, that's your privilege talking. And I'm like, shit, now I got to engage in politics because I, I do see my privilege and I, you know, it is more transparent to me than, you know, than not. As far as, you know, what to do about the whole thing. I, I don't know. I mean, that's what, what are your thoughts on it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, one of the nice things about the way Wilbur lays things out is this quadrants thing. And mm -hmm. I think that it's really important to think about guys like, you know, Bill Clinton or Obama as maybe getting it in mm -hmm. their subjectivity, but nonetheless, they're part of a system. And if that system doesn't get it, then that person's personal understanding doesn't really change anything for people. Yeah. And I think that um, for a number of historical reasons, the, the actual progressives, not the woke centrists, but the actual progressives, um, uh, they inherit a critique of the systems that we're a part of. So I'm, I'm with Jeremy and what I tend to think that that's the sign of the higher centrism of the future is it definitely involves the ideological critique that we associate with progressives at the moment. Yeah. Although, I don't think they're going to get there unless they enfold a, a more right-leaning conservative spirit, at least into the aesthetics and ethos of what they're trying to do. Yeah, no, no, I, I completely agree with that, man. And like, um, so like, I guess I would say like, you know, more of a present oriented politic, you know, like more, what can we do right now? How can we ground? What are the problems that we're, you know, currently facing and how can we turn an integral lens on those problems right here and right now to affect, you know, like to equally, you know, benefit everyone, you know, and not just the 1%, not just. And so like, yeah, I, I, I tend to leave all, all that to Jeremy, you know, and I, I do, you know, I'm a member of all of his groups, obviously, but, and the, the conversation is really robust there, but just not, you know, not in my sphere of like, and but, but yesterday sucked, you know what I mean? Like it was, yesterday was politically fueled and I, and I couldn't turn away from it. And I, I tanked, you know, yesterday was really hard for me. Um, and I, I even tried to stay optimistic about it by posting, you know, um, this testing America's democracy and testing, you know, putting a gorilla in the cage and seeing if the cage is strong enough. And that cage is, is turning out to be strong enough for now. You know what I mean? So like um, I believe in democracy. Absolutely. I believe that there's, you know, better ways to do it. And I believe that, you know, it's up to people that have a holistic um perspective on life to be able to, to, to put those things in place, you know, but I would love to see a day where power didn't matter anymore, yeah. you know, um, but that's, that's my utopian thinking, you know, this is a fantastic conversation. I I've would, had fun. I yeah. would personally do it for hours, but I think we're pushing the limit of what somebody on the internet is going to watch. <laughs> so before we go, um, if people want to find out more about your project or maybe get engaged with it, where would they go? What would they look for? Okay. So the, the project is called the origin project, the project. Yeah. The thing is called, uh, the community is called the origin project. And we have, um, so we have a website, it's exploring origin.com. Uh, the Facebook is the Facebook is forward slash exploring origin, Twitter, exploring origin, um, Instagram, exploring origin, uh, the group, which you can actually access through the, um, through the Facebook page is uh, groups forward slash the origin project. Um, we have a really robust conversation going on there right now. Um, I've also curated over the last couple of years of collecting, you know, really great articles and posts and things like that. Curated a nice unit section where we talk about, you know, uh, the, the new integral ideas that are coming out of the woodwork right now. And, you know, authors that haven't been in the, in the high, in the, um, in the spotlight until now where, you know, because it's now time for, a, a more robust conversation. So, um, so yeah, units like uh, uh, integral community, um, ecology, economy, uh, a really cool series called Origin Solutions, where we look at you know like the the you know, the different interdisciplinary approaches to bringing 
you know, like disciplines together, the sciences, the, you know, the different you know, structures to be able to create robust solutions that we might not have thought of if we were so siloed, right? Um, and so, yes, good conversation. And as soon as, you know, as soon as the pandemic kind of starts letting down, we are trying to incorporate as a nonprofit community benefit organization. We want to create a community center here in Atlanta to be able to bring in people to explore culture and to explore human origins and, you know, um, time and space and all of those things. So, but that is, that is a future oriented <laughs> project that we're working towards in the present. Um, but yeah, everything's online right now. So. Dude. Wow, this has been truly fun, Adam. Thank you. We should talk again sometime. This is a great way to spend a morning, man. I really had a lot of fun here. I appreciate you so much for inviting me on, man. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.